All right, Bridge Point, welcome. If you're joining us at one of our campuses, whether it's downtown or Seminole or watching online, YouTube, podcast live, or later in the week, or here at Tyrone, glad that you are with us today. We are in week two of a series called Out, called Toward, and called Up, a series that has us going through the book of James. Now, if you missed the introduction from last week, the book of James is a book of the Bible. It's located in the New Testament, and while we call it a book, It is actually a letter, a letter that is written by a guy named James. James just so happens to be the half brother to Jesus. So the half brother to God himself, to Jesus Christ. And so I just envisioned their childhood being interesting, riding bikes together, getting the ice cream from the ice cream truck, scouts, competing at everything. James is always jealous because Jesus is perfect. So he's winning everything. He's getting the most valuable player and James is always most improved. Interesting story, I'm sure but that's not what James is writing about. James is writing this letter to the church. He's writing this letter to Jews who had, been, uh, who had fled from religious persecution. So to Jews who are in exile, they're scattered all over the place. They're living away from home. They're in a foreign and unfamiliar land. And so his main reason for writing is to encourage them and to give them some instructions. James is writing to encourage them to remain steady in their faith. He's encouraging them not to give up, and he's also giving them some instructions for living out their faith in the midst of trying times, challenging and difficult circumstances. Last week, Pastor Tyler got us started in chapter one, where James instructs the church to consider it pure joy when facing trials and temptations, reminding the church that even in the most challenging circumstances, they can experience joy, not because of their challenges, not because of their trials, but in spite of them suggesting that joy is, is deeper than just what's going on around us, but that joy is rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. Today, we're gonna be focusing on a couple of verses that, that are found in chapter two of James, where James shifts his attention to the importance of action, living out their faith, the importance of, of doing the work, of actually putting their faith into action. Now, speaking of doing the work, I had an opportunity this past week to learn that important lesson, the importance of doing the work while helping my daughter with her math homework. So our our daughter is is eight, she's in the third grade and there's homework in the third grade and Morgan and I, my wife and I, we help out from time to time where it's needed and we share in the parenting, we're both engaged, but we both have our strengths. And while Morgan's academic strengths are pretty universal, mine stop well short of math. All right, now now listen, I've got the basics. I I know the basics, all right? Uh, I know one plus one, two. Two plus two, four. Four plus four, 632, right? Like I've got it, I've got the basics down, but I'm not that great at math. I know this, Morgan knows this, Hannah knows this, and now you know this. But I'm the one who is volunteering to help Hannah with her math homework. And the math that they get today is not the math that I learned in the 80s. The math that they learn today is called common core math. And admittedly, I have no idea what that is, what that means, or how to do it. So by helping Hannah with her homework, I mean, I was sitting in the chair next to her while she was working on her homework. I was watching her do it. And the equation that she was working on was 220 minus 92. And Hannah is a smart kid. She knows what she's doing, but she was having a hard time with this particular problem. So she had her paper out, her homework paper out, and she was putting numbers all over the place. I mean, there were numbers everywhere. She was scratching through the original ones. She was drawing arrows to new ones. There were dots with circles. It looked like a playbook for the Buccaneers. I had no idea what was going on. It was mathematical chaos. All right, and actually now that I think about it, maybe we did have common core math back in the 80s, but we just referred to it as graffiti and it was frowned upon in the school system. So, you know, neither here nor there. But Hannah's working on her homework and she finished the problem and she looked up at me as if she wanted me to to affirm her and say, yes, that's the correct answer. And I had absolutely no idea what took place on that sheet of paper. So when she asked, is that the right answer? I said, sweetie, uh, just go back and do it again and, and check your work. Right? I pretended like I knew the answer and it was more about her discovering the answer than me telling it to her, but it was really just a stall tactic because when she went back to work the problem again, I reached into my pocket, pulled out my phone, got the calculator out, put it in 220 minus 92, figured out it's 128. Write that down, most important part of this sermon today. 
I didn't want her to just spend all that time again writing those numbers out, so I leaned over to help her out and I said, hey, sweetie, you had the right answer. It is 128. And she asked me, how did you get there? I said, I did the math. She said, but how did you get there? And I said, I just, why does it matter anyways? And she said, well, can you show me on paper? And I said, no, I've already been to school. All right, I've already been a student. This is your time. You're now the student. This is an opportunity for you to learn and not for me to give you the answers. And she said, but we have to show our work. And I said, sweetie, a rule is a rule. All right. And she said, but if we don't show our work, then we don't get credit. All right, and it's getting intense. And right at that moment, Morgan walks in and she offered to finish helping out. So I was off the hook and I got to go lay down on the couch and rest my brain because this math was already, even the calculator math was getting to me, but just the stress of helping a third grader with their homework is, is tremendous. And so I needed to lay down after helping her with this common core math. I don't get it yet to go to a store where they're writing out the problem when they're giving you change or having a hard time with the math. So I didn't understand why, if they're gonna have a calculator later on, why do they need to learn it now? Again, neither here nor there. I had the correct answer. It was 128. I just had nothing to show for it. I had the correct answer. It was 128. I just had no proof of that work. There was no evidence of that work. And Hannah made it clear, if you do not show your work, you do not get credit. Now I'm sharing this with you for two reasons. All right, the first of which is I'm looking for a math tutor. And if you know of anyone, or if you are good at math and you wanna help me out, would love to talk to you afterwards. But the second reason that I'm sharing this with you is because I think this same mindset tends to extend beyond third grade common core math. I think this mindset tends to creep in to the Christian faith as well. You see, there are some Christians that believe faith is all that matters to God, and there is no need to show your work, all right? And then there are other Christians who believe that, that works really matters, that works is important, that showing your work, showing proof and evidence of your work is of great importance. And it tends to be an either or conversation, right? It's either faith or it's works. And so we're either team faith or we're team works. And the fact that we live in a performance-based culture doesn't help. We live in a culture that judges us by our actions, right? We live in a culture that, that determines our value based on what we do and how well we do it. We get grades in school. We get performance reviews at work. So it's no wonder that there are people that think that God is just this principal or this teacher who is up in heaven, sitting on his heavenly throne with a grade book, watching our every move, judging and grading our every thought and every action, giving us credit when we do good and giving us a slash when we mess up. And, and as if God is recording all of our grades until the very end when he's gonna determine whether or not we have enough credit based on showing our work to get into heaven for salvation. All right, and there are scriptures that support both. There are scriptures that support team faith and there are scriptures that support team works. And so I want us to look at a few of these team faith scriptures as we get started. The first one coming from the book of Galatians, chapter two, verse 16, which reads like this, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, yet yeah, we know that a person is not justified, meaning centered with, made right with, right relationship by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. The next one, Romans 3.28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And this next one in Ephesians chapter two, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Here, the, the Apostle Paul makes it pretty clear that justification comes to us by God's grace through our faith in Jesus Christ alone and not because of anything that we do, not because of works. It's clear that by placing our faith in Jesus, we are rescued from the consequences of sin and death that were brought into right relationship with God, meaning we're justified, made right before God, and that works, what we do, has nothing to do with our salvation, right? These scriptures suggest that we're not required to show proof of our work, that we're not required to show evidence of our work for salvation. And so the big question that I want us to, to start with today is this, why is works part of the equation if the answer is having faith in Jesus Christ? 
Let me read it again. Why is works part of the equation if the answer is having faith in Jesus Christ? In our scripture for today, James emphasizes the importance of works and the need for works. But here's the thing. His reason for works goes beyond the question of salvation alone. In our passage, the passage that we're going to look at today comes from James chapter 2. We're going to be landing in verses 14 through 17. And starting in verse 14, James begins his defensive works by writing this. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? All right, so right off the bat, it appears that James is contradicting other scriptures, that James here in this text is contradicting other parts of the Bible. It appears here that James is suggesting that faith without works is not enough for our salvation, that faith without works is not enough to save someone. It looks like James is saying that salvation is dependent upon works, that being saved is based on our credit, the credit that is earned as a result of what we do and how well we do it. And what happens oftentimes when we read this passage, when we read this verse, especially the end, we hear, can faith without works save someone? And then that is how this passage, this text, this verse is often interpreted. This is where most people get stuck and they begin to debate with one another. But here's the thing. Here's what stood out to me this week. This isn't the only question that James asks here in this passage. All right, notice the first question that James asks is, what good is it? All right, the first thing he wanted them to consider is what good it is. What good is it if someone says that they have faith, but they don't, excuse me, they don't have works? You see, the secondary question that he's asking is, can that faith save them? And that question, the secondary one, it's a rhetorical one. Yeah, that faith can save him. If that faith, which he's referring to, is faith in Jesus Christ and faith in the redemptive work, the salvific work that Jesus offered on the cross, if that is what your faith is in, yeah, that faith can save him. But answer me this, why do we always skip past that first question? Why do we always skip past his original question? He first asks, what good is it if someone has faith but does not have works. And let's keep reading because James uses an illustration to present his original question again. Pick it up in verse 15 and 16. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? James is saying to the church, right? Suppose that someone in your community, someone in your church community, someone around you is in need. Let's say that there's someone around you who is in need of clothing and someone who is in need of food. And you see this, you notice this, and all you say, your only response is, man, I'm so sorry, right? Like, I hate this for you. Like, this is no good at all. God, but, but you know what? God's got it. Right, like hang in there, good luck. You're in my thoughts and prayers. Hope that someone gives you something to eat. Hope that someone gives you some clothes to wear. I'm sure that somebody's gonna have something for you. He says, suppose that you see someone who is in need, a very specific need, and all you say is best of luck. God's got it. I have faith. He says, what good is that? He goes back to that original question. He says, what good is your faith if you see an opportunity to help out, if you have an opportunity to put it into action and you do nothing to help? And again, another rhetorical question, the answer being that kind of faith is no good at all. Friends, it doesn't seem like James is arguing or making an argument for works-based salvation. It actually seems like he's making an argument for a faith that is useful. It seems like he's making an argument for faith that is good that is put to work, that is effective. The point that James is making is that simply telling people you have faith without acting on it, without putting it into action is useless. It's no good at all. It's a lip service kind of faith that isn't good. It appears that James is calling them out of this lip service kind of faith alone, suggesting that it is passive, that it's complacent, that it's incomplete, and it's a useless kind of faith, that it is inactive, and it's no good at all. He's calling them out of this lip service kind of faith and he's calling them toward a faith that is being lived out. He's calling them toward a faith that is being practiced, a faith that is useful and a faith that is good. Simply put, James is warning the church, don't talk the talk, 
if you're not gonna walk the walk. All right, and I liken this to, to, to someone, and you probably know someone like this, or you are someone like this, that has all the gear, all the equipment, all the knowledge, and they never put it into practice. Right, I can think of a buddy in, in college that was a, a fisherman, an avid fisherman, had all the stuff, all the gear, all the rods, all the reels, had, had fish hanging on his wall in his apartment, but never seemed to get out and fish. Knew all the answers, knew what to tell people to do, what, what, what to use and how to use it. But he never put it into practice. He never went out and caught a fish. He never produced anything. Had all the gear, all the equipment, all the knowledge, but he never put it into practice. James is saying, what good is faith if you have it, but you do not use it? You never produce anything. You have nothing to show for it. What good is that faith? All right, I want us to keep reading because I think it's in the next verse. I think it's in verse 17 that James reveals the, the significant implications of a faith that is incomplete. I think it's in verse 17 that he uh, gives the serious implications uh, of disconnecting faith from works and why he believes that this incomplete faith is no good at all. Picking up in verse 17, which is where we're gonna land today, James finishes this part writing this. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Here in verse 17, James makes this strong claim that faith, that is standalone faith, faith by itself is dead. That faith without works, if it doesn't include works, is dead. And as simple as a concept as this might be to grasp and to understand, I believe that this is one of the more challenging and difficult verses in all of scripture. Why? Because death matters. Death matters, especially when we're talking about faith. All right, think about it. If something is dead, that means, yes, obvious, but stay with me, it's not alive. If something is dead, it means it can no longer be active. Something that is dead, it no longer works. It no longer functions. If something is dead, it no longer produces anything. Nothing can change. Nothing can grow. Nothing can reproduce. All right, and so I think of the image of a tree. You could go with a flower or a plant or a tree, but think of a tree, a tree that is alive. It is gonna have a strong root system. It's gonna have a healthy trunk and it's gonna have uh, branches, strong branches and limbs and either produce leaves or flowers. There's gonna be evidence of life. There's gonna be hope for new growth. There's gonna be a possibility of reproduction, of new life occurring. However, a tree that is dead, it does not. A tree that is dead, it has no life. There is no new growth, which means it stops being able to produce anything at all. And in the end, when something is dead, in the end, when something dies, it eventually breaks down. It eventually breaks down and it withers away and it's no longer there. James is suggesting that the very same thing is true with our faith. He's saying a living faith, it produces something. A living faith shows evidence of life. It shows signs of life. There is evidence of new beginnings, hope of new beginnings. And it is a faith, a living faith that provides hope saying it's not over. It's not withering away. He's saying if faith is not producing evidence of life, if works are not being produced by our faith, what good is that kind of faith? He answers, it's no good at all because it's a faith that is dead. And here's the thing. This isn't just some like crazy initiative that James came up with to convince the churches that he was writing to, to, to keep at it and to keep plugging away. This wasn't just his plan. This is something that Jesus taught his disciples as well. Jesus taught his disciples that, that following him encompassed more than just faith alone. Let me see an example of this in Matthew's gospel. All right, this is just after what's called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus has given a very famous uh, sermon on the side of a mountain. He's gone through a lot of teaching to the disciples, to followers, to people who have gathered along the side of the mountain. And in verse uh, 16, of Matthew chapter five, Jesus says this, Jesus himself says this, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. This is Jesus talking and he's talking to those around him, those who are following and those who are potentially looking to follow. And he says, let your light shine before others so that, why? So that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. 
Jesus himself instructs his followers to let their light shine before others. Why? So that others may see their good works. This is a clear call that moves beyond faith alone, and it's one that encourages good works and doing good, putting that faith into action, making that faith evident to those around them. But here is a very important part of this passage that we cannot overlook. The reason for these good works that Jesus is encouraging and telling his his followers, his disciples to, to let their light shine, the reason for these good works is not to have a legitimate relationship with God. All right, the reason for these good works is not to be in good standing with God. It has nothing to do with salvation or being saved. Instead, the reason for good works is because that in them and through them, people have an opportunity to see what is behind them. And when God is behind our works, when God is behind everything that we do, when God is the reason we do what we do, Jesus says that God can be glorified which seems to imply that works really isn't all that much about us and possibly not even about those folks that we are putting our faith into work, into practice for. It seems to imply that works has little to do with us and that works isn't really just about our salvation. Rather, the reason for works is so that others can experience a glimpse of God so that others can get a glimpse of God's mercy, so that others can get a glimpse of God's goodness and grace, so that others can get a glimpse of God's love. And when the power and when the presence of God is seen in us and through us, Jesus says that God is glorified, not us. So here's the big idea that I want us to to focus in on today. Works is evidence that faith has positioned our lives under the mercy, grace, and love of Jesus Christ. Works, what we do, everything that we say and do, putting our faith into practice, works is evidence that faith has positioned us, positioned our lives, positioned every aspect of us under the mercy, under the grace, and under the love of Jesus Christ. All right, so hear me now. We're we're gonna make this clear. Works is not what saves us. Works is not tied, tethered to, or any kind of credit for salvation. Faith in Jesus Christ does that, okay? That's that. However, once we have come to experience and embrace the mercy, the forgiveness, the grace, and the love of Jesus Christ, once we place our faith in Jesus, once our lives and our hearts, every aspect of us has been transformed by Jesus, then our lives will produce evidence, evidence that reveals our faith, evidence that makes God known to others, and evidence that brings glory to God. Amen? And so I want to end with, a, with an illustration of how I see this. And it involves my daughter again. Sorry, every illustration involves her. I apologize to her as well. But a few years ago, I took my daughter Hannah to Bush Gardens. All right, this was a daddy-daughter date. We were gonna ride some roller coasters. We were gonna eat a little bit of junk food, watch some of those shows, and just have fun. So we got all ready. We packed up. We left early. There was excitement in the truck as we were making our way up to Bush Gardens. We we arrived what I thought was early. We parked and made our way in, only to see that that it seemed like thousands of other people had the same idea and had already shown up. And we walk in, and we're thinking, where's the best spot to go? Which one should we ride first? What's our game plan for the day? And Hannah starts off right off the bat, the very beginning of the day, saying, I want to go ride River Rapids. All right, now, if you're familiar with Bush Gardens, you know about River Rapids. If you're not, it is a water ride. It is a raft that holds about eight to 10 people and goes down this man-made river at Bush Gardens. There's small rapids. There's opportunities for water to splash up on you. Not really the end of the world or that big of a deal until the end of the ride where there is this waterfall. And someone on the ride is gonna get hit by this waterfall. It never fails. Someone on the raft, the way they move that raft, somebody One of the two seats, two of the four seats, two of the 10 seats, however many are going to get covered by the water from the waterfall. And I didn't want to get wet. 
All right, now I'm not like afraid of water. It wasn't that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. I'm more like a log flume kind of guy than river rapids. But at the start of the day, I didn't want to get soaking wet or have the potential to be soaking wet because that would mean the rest of the day was walking around in socks and shoes that are wet with wet clothing. And it just doesn't seem like fun. But it's daddy daughter day at Bush Gardens. And so I caved, I said, yes. And we went straight to river rapids and we got in line. As we're walking through the, the little gate, the track to get us up to the front of the line where we can get on the raft, all I can think about is this waterfall. All right, Hannah's just super excited. She's ready to ride. She's ready to have a fun day. And I'm like distracted because all I can think of is that waterfall and how if we get stuck under, under that waterfall, it's gonna ruin our day. And if not, then it'll be fun and we can go back to, to having fun. So we got in line and all I'm thinking about is this waterfall. And then we get up to where we can start to get on the raft. And I look at the raft and, and there's some dry seats and some wet seats. And so obviously I'm like, all right, those dry seats, God is smiling upon those seats. Like those are not gonna be getting wet. So like those are the ones that we choose. May have pushed some people out of the way to jump in line and to get to those seats. But we sat in the dry seats, the, the heavens opened up. Those are the ones that weren't gonna get wet and off we go. All right, there's this metal wheel in the middle of the raft, if you're familiar with it, that everybody thinks is a steering wheel. So they all lean forward and like, hold on. And they're steering and everybody's having fun. It doesn't move, but they're steering, having fun. People are smiling and laughing, all is well. And I'm just focused, laser beam on that waterfall, looking up. I might be saying a prayer or two, thinking like, God, please don't let us get stuck under this waterfall. So we're cruising down the river, all right? And we're, we're having fun. Bouncing off, the river goes, you know, this way and that way. And as the, as the raft is going, everybody's laughing and having fun. A little bit of water here, a little bit of water there. I'm lifting my feet up so they don't get wet. Everybody's giggling, having a good time. But I'm locked in on that waterfall. We come around the corner and there she is. She's off on the side. And so everybody's starting to talk about it and I'm looking at it. And then the raft starts to bounce. It goes from side to side, right? It keeps you on your toes. All right, it's go time. So I'm locked in on this waterfall and it bounces this way. And as it turns, I'm looking at the waterfall and I'm making sure I don't keep my eyes off. Then we go this way. I'm looking at it. I'm watching where I'm steering as hard as I can. I mean, I'm moving this raft and we come around the corner and we bounce off the wall, bounce off this wall. Looks like they're gonna get it, not me. I'm a pastor, God, thank you. They're getting soaking wet, hit it again. And there Hannah and I go directly under the waterfall. Water is pouring out on our heads. It messes her hair all up. It made my hair fall all out. It was a mess. We were soaking wet. Every single inch of us was covered with water. We were drenched. And then we made our way to the little conveyor belt where they, you know, everybody else is smiling and I'm pretending to have a good time. And we ride up to where they let us out for an entire day of walking around soaking wet. And that's just what we did. Hannah and I got off and she's all excited. And she said, we got the waterfall, we got the waterfall. And I'm just standing there and we start walking through, you know, the line where we're doing that soaking wet walk where it's uncomfortable, you're not having fun, but you're obviously just soaking wet. Your shoes and your socks, they are squeaking and water is just pouring out of them. There's water, it's just so uncomfortable. Everywhere that we went, there was a trail of water behind us. We're squeaking, people are like, oh, River Rapids. Hannah's like, River Rapids. I'm like, River Rapids. And we sit down for lunch. And when we got up, there's, there's puddles on the chairs because we were drenched for a few hours. Everywhere that we went, everything that we did, we left water. Hannah couldn't stop talking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And everybody knew we had been on River Rapids. Why? Because there was evidence all around us. Water all behind us, noises, sounds, all of it. It was evident that we had ridden River Rapids. Friends, the same is true when it comes to our faith. The moment we place our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, God positions us under a waterfall of his mercy. God positions us under this waterfall of his grace and his love. God just pours out mercy, grace, and love all over us, covering every aspect of us, our past, 
our present, and our future. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, God positions us under a waterfall of his mercy, grace, and love. And when that happens, every aspect of our lives will change. When that happens, it will change the way that we feel. It will change the way that we think. It will change the way that we walk. We won't be able to stop talking about it and we won't be able to stop thinking about it and we won't be able to help but to leave evidence behind us everywhere that we go. Evidence of God's mercy, evidence of God's grace, evidence of God's forgiveness and goodness and compassion and love. Evidence all around us. And you know what? People will begin to notice. When we place our faith in Jesus, when we become a follower, when we choose to follow, when we give our lives over, we are positioned under a waterfall of God's mercy, grace, and love. And it changes everything, and that change is evident to the people around us. Friends, nothing that we do can earn our salvation. No good deed, no random act of kindness, no, no serving others, no volunteering outside the church, no leading in the church. None of these things justify us before God. None of these things are what save us, but it is evidence of the one who did. And so friends, let me bring it to you for a moment. Let us reflect on our lives and let me ask you a question. What good is your faith? For your life, how, what, what good is your faith? If your faith is in Jesus Christ, will that faith save you? Absolutely, but what good is that faith? Are you living it out? Is it producing evidence of God's goodness? Is it producing evidence of God's grace? Or might it appear to be dead? You see, the purpose of, of showing our work is not to earn credit. And it's not to earn enough credits for salvation. Our, the purpose of showing our work is to bring glory to God. And who knows, when people see evidence of God's mercy, evidence of God's grace and God's love, when people see evidence of our faith, that our faith is in Jesus Christ, who knows, maybe that faith does, in fact, have the power to save. Amen? Will you pray with me? Gracious God, you invite each and every one of us along for the ride. A ride of, of freedom, a ride of, of life. You invite us to experience your goodness and to place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and to be covered by your mercy, your grace, and your love. God, my prayer is that once we have experienced that, we won't just take it for granted and we won't sit back and have a complacent kind of faith and a complacent life. That once we come to experience that, that it will cover every aspect of us so that everything that we do, everywhere that we go, will leave a trail of evidence behind us, not for our glory and our salvation, but for yours and your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.